colors. Russian history. The matter is that uh, Yuta, uh, besides uh, her capacity, is also quite an interesting person. So I would like uh, to take uh, uh, part of uh, some time of the session uh, to tell uh, very few facts uh, uh, that I know um, in her biography. You might have noticed already that she is uh, the only expert. Um, uh, who belongs to two countries already, and it's not accidental. Uh, she passed uh, some specific uh, um, uh, life, so it so happened that uh, Germany and France are both her home. And uh, uh, Mrs. Scherer um, uh, asked me to uh, adjust uh, the agenda, and uh, she's a historian, and uh, she's not a director of the Social uh, Sciences School. Uh, she's just uh, a historian there, and um, uh, Professor uh, Ayuta Scherer is a great friend to uh, the school, and she's very much enthusiastic about uh, uh, the school. So belongs uh, to the people who uh, actually uh, had started all that with the school, and uh, um, uh, can I dare ask you how long you do you know Lena and Yuri? And uh, uh, because uh, I know that it is a very long story. And uh, Yuta, uh, uh, sorry if I missed uh, anything from your introduction, but uh, all those things that are known to me, I have conveyed uh, to the audience. And uh, uh, for me, it's great and honor to sit next to you. Uh, good evening. Thank you uh, for very kind words. Uh, I'm very grateful. Um, for the opportunity uh, to be here and uh, speak uh, before uh, the students of the school. It's a great honor for me, great, and uh, personally I'm very pleased. Lena and Yuri um, are my, uh, one of the oldest friends, uh, they are very closest friends in Russia. I uh, never could work in the Soviet uh, uh, Union because of the political uh, reasons. When I first came to Russia, in uh, 1987, I met uh, uh, Yuri and uh, Lena, and since then uh, we've been close, very close friends. And uh, from the very uh, uh, start, uh, from the very foundation of the school, I've been living uh, the life uh, of school with them. I actually shared uh, the. Uh, Testing at that school with them. And uh, I would also like to say that the participants I met here uh, make up the elite of the uh, young generation of Russia. So I'm really uh, very grateful uh, uh, to the school for all the uh, uh, interactions and networking that I have, for all the information that I'm receiving from you, which I cannot get from a media or books. And I would like to apologize for speaking English uh, uh, while I'm making my presentations since uh, it's only two, year, two days ago uh, uh, that I finished uh, a, a very big work uh, in English and it's hard, you know, to switch from one language to another um, just like that. But I'm certain that uh, interpreters will do a good job and uh, you will be um, able to uh, understand what I'm talking about and ask uh, your uh, questions. The uh, 
subject uh, that I'm going to, uh, to uh, speak of is coming to terms uh, with the past uh, and uh, the task of uh, the work of the To uh, engage you with my presentation and to talk about generations and discuss with you to which degree a generation or several generations can contribute to the identity construction of a society, if not of a nation. Can a national cultural identity change from one generation to the next due to uh, the different experiences and life expectations of a generation? And if yes, which are the factors with which a new younger generation as yours, for instance, can contribute to these changes, to which degree the political uh, engagement of a generation or of an opposition uh, can be decisive for the construction of a democratic political culture and the civil society. I will base my talk on the German post-war experience of coming to terms with the past as a work at the task of generations. My understanding of generation goes back to the German sociologist Karl Mannheim, who had been mentioned before, who first developed a generation theory in an article published in 1928. His point of departure were those whose common experience was the first World War, and who were sometimes called the lost generation, and those who lived between the two world wars. In short, those whose actions and value systems were characterized by the accelerated phenomena of the convulsions of this period of its particular political dynamics. Later sociologists like Pierre Bourdieu and Ismail Eisenstadt and others developed the theory uh, further. Today, historians as me, working on the Russian intelligentsia, uh, use it in the sense of Mannheim and uh, Bourdieu. Uh, in Russia, more recently, the sociologist Boris Dubin, the literary critic uh, Zergi Zenkin, the historian Pyotr Shamin, started to make the generation theory known at the beginnings of the uh, 20th uh, of our century, uh, and it is used now uh, also very often in studying the uh, generation of the uh, intelligentsia. For uh, the uh, purpose of my paper, I consider that the generational context is given by chronological simultaneity and a more or less common perception of events and reaction to them. The perception of events is based on the same experiences and challenges whose origins can be political and social transformations or radical changes, upheavals such as wars and revolutions. Let me uh, start with some personal remarks. I grew up in Berlin, at first in the eastern Soviet part of the city, later in the western part. There was no other city in post-war Germany which was to such a degree marked, if not traumatized, by the Second World War and the aftermath of German National Socialism. The terrifying exposures and revelations of National Socialism, the division into East and West, the reality of the Cold War, were nowhere in Europe at all reflected as in Berlin. The Berlin Wall was just the most visible symbol of the Cold War. It was its utmost consequence. Growing up in such a city, whose heritage reminds you day by day of the past and whose traces are by the way visible until today. Growing up in such a city made me aware 
at the rather young age of the presence of the past, of the presence of history in my life and later in my future, in so far that I became almost by necessity a historian. Already in our early youth, quite a few of us who grew up after the war wanted to know about the personal experiences of our parents and our families. We wanted to know from them how this all had happened. However, most of our parents and families did not want to talk. They did not want to remember they kept silent. And when they spoke, it was about their personal losses, fathers, brothers, and sons who had died in the war, who, who had not come back from the war, which was my mother's case. They remembered their apartments or houses which were bombed, destroyed, or they remembered the eastern parts of Germany from which quite a few were expelled. In short, they were the victims of Hitler. The generation which took part in the war and who had been responsible for the rise of National Socialism and for Hitler's democratic election had basically only one interest after 45 to rebuild their country, their homes and family lives, to go back to work as usual, and to produce material well-being. In creating the so-called economic miracle, the Wirtschaftswunder of the Federal Republic, they were occupied by the present and suppressed or repressed what they had known and seen, how they had behaved themselves, and what their part of responsibility had been. The psycho uh, psychoanalysts Alexander and Margaret Mitchell spoke of the Unfähigkeit zu trauen, the inability to mourn, a book which appeared in 67 and became quite famous and which Lev Gutkoff uh, mentioned in his talks some days ago concerning your explanation. Of course, there were individual personalities who openly discussed the past immediately after the end of the war. The philosopher Karl Jaspers, the Protestant theologian Barbert, the first president of the Federal Republic, Theodor Horst, were among those who spoke of collective responsibility and, most of all, collective shame. Almost untranslatable content, concepts like Aufarbeitung der Vergangenheit, Prorabotka Trosovo, and most of all, Bewältigung der Vergangenheit, Preodorilie Trosovo, in English, to come to terms with the past or to assume the past, these new uh, words entered the post war German vocabulary. These concepts were created and first used by some historians, some philosophers, sociologists, writers, and also by a few politicians, among them Tilda Hoyes. But they did not enter immediately the public discourses. One could not find them in the school books of Argonaut Germany. A generational change took place in the second half of the 60s. It was in particular the 68, my generation, which brought up the German past and its moral implications by accusing directly our parents' and grandparents' responsibility. It was a rather extremist or provocative attitude and concerned only small segments of our generation. But the repercussions were felt in numerous public debates, publications, literature, films, works of art, and they continue in some way or the other until today. The claim of some leading moral figures of the Federal Republic that the Prorabotka Prosova should become a large societal engagement and that the German legacy of the history of the World War II and the Holocaust 
should become a part of the new German national identity and of the politics of history of the Federal Republic, presuppose, of course, governmental initiatives and educational instances, which I have no time to describe them here in detail. I published a longer article about this in Pro and Contra. Let me just underline that it was a very long and a very difficult way, marked by the political will to remember that the consensus of the German post-war society was obtained to admit that coming to terms with the past was the precondition for a democratic statehood and for Germany's integration into Europe. It needed the cooperation of several generations. For this purpose, among many other factors, contemporary history and oral history were already in the 50s introduced into the history department as independent disciplines. Oral history of eyewitnesses became an ever more important element of political education and politics of memory. Survivors of the concentration camps were and still are invited to speak in schools about their experience. Former members of the German Wehrmacht, the army, who had taken a critical distance of their past, were invited to speak to pupils in schools. Thus, the generation of the eyewitnesses met with the youngest generation thanks to the intermediary role of the post-war generation. The transmission of knowledge and experience of the past is taking place from one generation to the next and to the over next. And it is exactly this transmission of experience from one generation to the other which constitutes our historical consciousness and our historical responsibility, without which the civil society is not functioning. In other words, even the war generation or the Hitler generation, with its silence after 45, contributed indirectly through the intermediary of a new post war generation, which felt provocated by the silence of their parents. The war generation it contributed to the building up of a new German identity. Of course, the youngest generation is not guilty for what the older generation had done, but it bears responsibility, which is not the same as the responsibility for uh, this should never happen again. If I may come back for a moment to my own family history, my mother was already over 80 years of age when she started to speak and to remember what she had seen 50 years ago. 50 years there was silence. Without any doubt, the numerous public debates in media, the impact of literature and arts, and probably most of all the factor of time and age had liberated her from her silence, her feeling of shame. A very important element for the generational work was and is education. In 1973, the President of the Federal Republic, Gustav Heinemann, supported by an industrialist Kerber, who became rich because he had invented the filter of uh, cigarettes and created a system, a foundation which exists until today. They both initiated a competition in German history for college and high school students. Its goal was to arise their interest for their own history and hereby create their responsibility. Without knowledge of Germany's history, it was impossible to come to terms with its past and to lay the foundation for a new generation of responsible citizens. 
Later, the history competition model was enlarged into a European history network called U Story, which functions until today. In 1999, the Memorial Society introduced the model of the Gerber Foundation in Russia and started the first Russian competition for high school students all over the country on the topic Men in History, Russia in the 20th Century. When this model was extended to the Ukraine, and when I was appointed a board member of the Ukrainian History Committee, I prepared myself for this task in reading the first history competition works of the young Russians, which Memorial had made accessible to me in Moscow. I had already the occasion to speak in the Moscow School of Civic Education in Petersburg, about my lecture of these materials. So please forgive me to repeat myself for a moment. It was absolutely amazing what this very young generation of Russians found out in doing research on abandoned buildings, historical monuments, or cemeteries. They went to archives and worked in libraries, discovered new facts, and found valuable documents in order to reconstruct the lives and fates of people and their individual stories. They did not concentrate on victories and achievements, but listened to the life stories of people who until then did not much speak about their past. They filled in the gaps in the history of their regions, which one would not find in any history book. I was overwhelmed by this lecture, and I was more than happy when I heard that the Russian history competition was ce celebrating its 15th anniversary of existence at this beginning of July. Out of these local history competitions grew some international history youth projects. I just want to mention a common German-Russian project on graves of Soviet forced laborers, laborers and Soviet prisoners of war in Germany. The precise numbers of uh, Soviet forced laborers and prisoners of war who died on German soil is not known right up to the present day. Most of the prisoners of war who died lie in anonymous mass graves. Many forced laborers and prisoners of war who were murdered in concentration camps or in Gestapo prisons have no grave site at all. Projects like this, who bring together young Russians and Germans to reflect on the common past, are in my eyes the best guarantee to overcome the political difficulties and tensions of the older generations. Let me come back to Germany. Twenty-five years have passed since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Ever new publications based on archival materials, very often from the Stasi and matters of oral history of eyewitness, remind until today of Germany's other or second totalitarian state. In 2010, an initiative called the the third generation of East Germany was founded by those who called themselves the children of the last real citizens of the German Democratic Republic. That means the children of the generation who was born, uh, not the children, uh, it means the generation who was born between 1975 and 1985 in the German Democratic Republic and who grew up there. The designation of the third generation of East Germany is, of course, a sociological construct. It presupposes the existence of a second and a first generation. The second generation are their parents, who were already born, socialized, educated in the German Democratic Republic, and who were working there. The first generation were the grandparents, the war generation, 
who were the founders of the German Democratic Republic after 45. The goal of this group, which exists in forms of rather small networks all over the five new East German Bundesländer, is to study the past, the present, and the future of their 2.4 million age cohort and to compare them with the same age group who was born in the western part of the country. You have here the uh, opposition of Ossis versus the term you know also in Russia. One of the main questions is how the last uh, German Democratic Republic generation was and still is reacting to the societal, economical, and political changes due to the reunification of the two Germanies. In short, how they react to the transition from socialism to capitalism. Let me remind you that the unemployment rate of this age group or generation from the German German Democratic Republic is with 19% almost twice as high as the one of the same age group in West, the western part of uh, Germany. Official German statistics, as conducted by the Statistical Office of the Federal Republic, do not any longer differentiate between Germans from the East and the West. Therefore, the newly founded group, the third generation of East Germany, is also looking for its statistical identity, which covers also those of the third generation who in the meantime left for the western part of the Federal Republic. Another very important and interesting point is that in some way this new generational group of former East Germans follows today the example of the West German 68 generation who had ex accused their parents for having ignored the Nazi past. Actually, the third generation of East Germans is asking their parents critical questions about what they had done in their GVR past. They push their parents to consult the Stasi archives. And some also confront their parents with the question of why in 89, after the fall of the war, they did, did not have favored a third way, a democratically reformed German Democratic Republic. A question which became redundant with the reunification uh, of Germany in 99. This initiative of, of young uh, Germans is by far not such an important movement as was the West German 68 generation. And most of all, they do not argue with the higher moral tone which was justified by the National Socialist crimes. But uh, interestingly uh, enough, uh, in 2012, 10% more former uh, GDR citizens consulted the Stasi archives uh, in uh, wishing to go back uh, to know something uh, about their past and how they were demonstrated. So if immediately after the fall of the war, the so-called civil rights activists determined the discourse about the East German Unrechtsstaat, the lawless state, the tone now is given by their successor generation. I choose these examples of the two German dictatorships to remind that much time is needed to overcome and to assume important historical breaks, and then it takes several generations to come to terms with the past, if ever one comes to terms with the past. I did not mention the German examples here as a lesson for Russians. The German way of coming to terms with the past is not a model 
for others. Each country has its own history and its own way to integrate its past into its identity and its political culture. As a German, I would feel ashamed to give lessons to Russians. I can only learn from you. But as a historian of your country, I take the liberty to remind you of the rich heritage which generations of Russians created for laying the foundations of a civil society. Alone in my life experience as a historian and visitor in Lubitsyn of Russia, I had the chance to meet personally representatives of the generation of the 60s in Shestidisyabiki, of the generation of the dissidents and human rights defenders, of the generation of those who believe that the first worker was releasing democratic and liberal values and hopes, and who tried to realize them at the beginning of the Yatsin era and some until today. I also met different generations of the Russian immigration in Western Europe and the United States. The experiences of those generations of Russians, their convictions, their political as well as their cultural and philosophical engagement cannot reclaim, replace your own experience and your own life expectations. But I'm sure that you can build on the heritage of which I myself, if I would be Russian, would feel very proud. Whichever way Russia is going in the near or not so near future, and the last days of the seminar showed a rather catastrophic picture. Nobody can take away what entire generations have achieved. It is perhaps the advantage of the historian in comparison with the political analyst that we think and argue in terms of long degree, of long time evolution, which leaves us more space for hope. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so very much, Yuta, for this uh, very, very um, important uh, presentation. We continue to deliberate, as what we did throughout today, about uh, thinking over our past uh, and indeed uh, blending our past into our own identity, coming to terms with our history. Questions and comments? In the will start. Let me uh, say in brief uh, that we are all um, very fortunate uh, to welcome you to here. Um, and uh, uh, to me, I have, uh, uh, I have read uh, Yuta's articles and works, and uh, she is uh, an extremely humble uh, person. Uh, but because I'm uh, a curious person myself, uh, and uh, I can um, glean a lot of information about her uh, in uh, the different um, uh, literature, um, uh, sources, I know that she worked with um, Georgi Florovsky, the great um, Russian name. Um, have you ever spoken with him about um, a memory? He must have thought a, a lot about uh, the motherland that he left behind. Um, did you, uh, was there anything that he ever evolved on this? Um, Flarovsky, uh, let me, let me uh, tell you, is the author of a um, monumental work uh, which is called uh, The Pathways of the Russian Theology, which uh, blends uh, together the pathways of the Russian history culture. It appears to me this is one of the best uh, works uh, um, devoted uh, to the uh, spiritual history of Russia. 
Florovsky uh, emigrated to, to France uh, and uh, then to the United States. Uh, when I was in Harvard, uh, he was there, the professor um, uh, of the Divinity uh, School or the Theology Department uh, of the Harvard University. And I was uh, a student uh, of the Russian Studies uh, Center. And uh, at that time, this was uh, a very politically positivist uh, um, center. It seemed uh, to me, well, we had uh, to, uh, for instance, uh, um, study how many of the Central Committee members were of, uh, of uh, proletarian or peasant background. This was a 100% positivist uh, uh, school. Um, and uh, uh, this was about how the Soviet system functions. Uh, um, and uh, the people of literature men of letters uh, had a different status and I as a, as a foreigner uh, with a fellowship uh, I uh, had an opportunity uh, not to take all of the courses of this Russian Research Center and I could work with uh, Flarovsky and uh, we had uh, three students. Uh, this was uh, by far not an apology. Uh, we, had, we were in the state of uh, Cold War with Russia, and uh, we had uh, to study how the Soviet Union functioned, and not the uh, history. And um, Flarovsky, um, when we became friends, uh, as you know, Uh, he, he belonged uh, to the so-called uh, Eurasian group, but he would, uh, did not uh, much want to talk about this. This, this had been his past, uh, uh, and uh, to him uh, the past was past, uh, the past was history. And the most interesting thing is that um, uh, Russian intelligentsia was also history. I never... I started working on my doctoral dissertation under his uh, um, uh, supervision. I wrote about the Russian intelligentsia, and then I worked uh, with others. Uh, but I never met uh, another uh, person who uh, had uh, such a uh, profound and indeed brilliant knowledge of the history of the Russian intelligentsia. And uh, he... Uh, never spoke about religion uh, or, or the, the orthodoxy. This was uh, a separate topic. Uh, this is not something that he was really prepared to discuss. Uh, Nail. Nail Barlangul from Ufa, from Bashkortostan. After World War II, uh, uh, about 20 years after World War II, the surge of uh, left-wing uh, terrorist organizations uh, surged in West Germany, and um, people uh, working uh, in, um, for, for leading quite a bourgeois life uh, go for this uh, urban guerrilla. Uh, what was the source of this process? Uh, I'm not sure I understood your question. You said... Uh, 25 years after World War II, did you say? And do you think that there were a lot of radicals? No, 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 this was a very small, small movement. This was a very small faction. These were people of my generation, this is true, um, of my generation of uh, 1968. Um, and um, as you said, uh, they were quite radical, uh, very left-wing, uh, very radical, and they wanted to, to um, destroy uh, the world around them. But there was another part of this same generation, which both in France and uh, 
and uh, in California and uh, in Germany who wanted to change the university structures uh, and uh, to change the authoritarian structures in the society. And uh, when I say, when I, I speak about uh, that part of the population who wanted to learn from our um, uh, parents what they could do, the radical group uh, took a different path. And the problems with Iran um, were already felt. You might remember the first and the last uh, Shah of uh, Iran. And there were great protests. Um, it would be interesting uh, to uh, see uh, how this uh, generation um, acted in Germany and France. We are neighboring countries and we had different approaches. Roman. Oh, you're not Roman. Vadim, I'm sorry, I apologize. Yes. Vadim Karovin. From Pskov. We all know um, about the two great examples, um, 1945 and 1989, the great two episodes uh, but uh, what other um, legal, social, or cultural consequences uh, were, um, or what efforts were taken by the German society or else the elites uh, and the state uh, that uh, could um, influence uh, the change in the German's mentality? Thank you. I do not know. I can't. Uh, I can't tell you. I think the most important uh, thing was that there were many people from the West uh, Germany, and especially. And the Grund Gesetz was uh, not changed. But uh, Madame um, Silke uh, Temple uh, spoke uh, um, to me in, uh, in a private conversation and said that our constitution is, uh, is uh, the best uh, that we have. Uh, and what I would like to I may not be answering your question um, quite uh, coherently, but even now there is the difference between the Aussies and the Wessies. And uh, for the people from the East Germany, they, s as they still cannot uh, accept that uh, they had to take up uh, the response that they had to take uh, so much uh, from the West Germany because they uh, had their uh, culture, their literature, uh, their uh, uh, ways of life, uh, lifestyle, um, associations, uh, civic uh, sector, um, and uh, system of relationships and um, from one day to another, they heard that you lived uh, wrongly, that you did, that the only important thing is, uh, uh, is our Western example. And this, uh, this uh, certainly plays a role, not everywhere. I wouldn't want to exaggerate this, but this uh, does, uh, this can be viewed. My best friend, uh, to 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 my, my best friend's daughter, to her, I'm a I'm a Wessie. I'm not too much of a Wessie because I live in France, uh, 
but uh, and but these categories are still there uh, in the mentality. Um, they they still work uh, and. Uh, There's nostalgia that uh, that uh, the past had been uh, better than uh, their present, and nobody wants to get back uh, to the GDR. But I think this is something that you might uh, feel uh, on the example of uh, the current day Russian uh, mentality. Thank you, thank you so very much for, for your uh, for your uh, for this. Uh, um, session. I'm Artur Rudakov from uh, Rostov on Don. In Russia, the um, consequences of totalitarianism are so close uh, to what Germany lived through. But uh, even though uh, the Stalin's uh, repressions and uh, uh, the Soviet history were uh, uh, criticized, uh, Russia did not work uh, its past, and we even see this rollback. And there are few uh, families in Russia that were untouched by Stalin's terror. Why did why does this happen? Well, we lost the war, and that was easy. We uh, everything was destroyed. This is your question is very easy to answer. If we had to start from scratch, if we had to start with scratch, with Germany lying in the ruins, uh, when uh, you had the Allied uh, armies with bayonets uh, who want uh, you to uh, um, base um, and uh, and found a democratic uh, structure, I think it is much uh, much easier. I won't say that uh, for. For the, for the Germans, it was easy. Uh, almost uh, there is hardly any family in Germany uh, which, uh, which um, almost nobody agreed with with the Nuremberg trial. But uh, but uh, indeed, gradually, uh, people uh, got used uh, to it. Uh, to this, uh, and I think that the Americans. Um, um, had a huge uh, propaganda uh, work, uh, and not just propaganda, but also educational work. They um, set an example, for, uh, and they started uh, giving the stipends uh, for the young Germans uh, to study uh, in America. They founded in West Berlin uh, the uh, Free University, Free University of Berlin, and they financed uh, uh, this uh, undertaking. And they indeed normalized the relations between uh, the United States and Germany. And there was a lot of exchange. Uh, almost uh, three and four, almost three and four years after the war, people started to travel between the two countries. And these um, uh, will uh, the great. Um, uh, the w great will of the Western political circles and the Western politicians meant a lot uh, to uh, to uh, rebuild the Germany and to um, indeed uh, get uh, uh, rid of the of the national socialist nightmare, which only lasted in Germany for 12 years, whereas Bolshevism lasted here for 70 years, and the GDR um, had 40 years of uh, the communist rule, which makes a world of difference. When I speak to the uh, to the East Germans, uh, to my friends in East Germany, I can see that 40 years is is uh, a lot more than 12, and 70 is a lot more than 40. So, um, because this was um, quite uh, conspicuous, uh, that uh, the catastrophe of Germany was so conspicuous, so our cities were in ruin, they were in shambles. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the Soviet Union was also devastated, but uh, you could always say that this was the Germans who, who uh, destroyed us. So we have to say that this is our fault, that we were... Uh, we were, but we are to blame. And on a psychological level, um, this is uh, something that uh, gives us uh, more um, ability 
to work through. Our past, and there were lots of uh, legislative initiatives. There was a will on the part of the young people to build uh, a democratic Germany. And these foundations and the institutions that we speak about, which have survived uh, uh, in Germany up until today, they, they still have this, uh, this value. It is not just about, uh, uh, in a way, it is a, um, a political or moralistic uh, um, uh, thing. And this was also a somewhat American-influenced uh, uh, model, because uh, before the war, uh, Germany had very strong uh, scientific uh, foundations, but not political uh, or ethical, uh, so to speak. And the Americans did that for Germany. And um, I think that uh, uh, this is what uh, the East uh, Germans uh, must have, uh, must have uh, borrowed. Olga Fadjeva from Yugra, human. Uh, I'm very thankful for your statement that responsibility is not the guilt. So it is the recognition of errors or mistakes and not penance, um, which is uh, extremely, um, extremely uh, important uh, to me. And what is uh, today's uh, the reason for the research? of the nationalism in, uh, in uh, so many countries of the world, uh, irrespective of their um, arrangement, state arrangement. Could you, could, you, could you repeat the last phrase of your question, please? The reason for the upsurge of the nationalism in both the um, authoritarian and democratic societies of today. Well, it's a question to a political scientist. Uh, it is hard for me to to consider this. Um, but what I could say is that I live in France and in Germany, um, and uh, in these uh, countries, uh, there are tendencies uh, for the nationalist tendencies. It is true, and. Uh, the experts say that this is a result of an economic crisis. Probably so. But I cannot say for sure uh, if this is the cause. I can only um, make um, a suggestion that those generations which or our parents uh, who were responsible for what had happened. <coughs> we had uh, a great task uh, to combat uh, the new uh, nationalism and the, the surge of, uh, of this new nationalism. Another thing is that uh, this uh, will uh, possibility to uh, Martina, would you like to ask a question? Martina Kwiatkowska, of Poland. I'm alumnus of 2011. Should I speak a bit louder? After I spoke about the projects of uh, Polish um, uh, Russian projects, Alexander from Crimea came to me and said uh, that uh, it is very important to, to start uh, three petite um, projects of Russia, Ukraine. Poland, and I, and I entirely agree with you, um, Alexandra, because uh, 
I think that uh, 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 Germany worked with Poland for many years to try and uh, get better understanding of, of, uh, between the Poles and the Germans and for the new generations uh, uh, to be uh, free from, uh, from the um, terrible burden of our common past. I think that Poland and Russia have a, a long way um, a long path. Um, I think that what we're seeing in Ukraine today deals uh, and concerns both the Russians, uh, the Ukrainians, and the Poles. Uh, and uh, in your, during your presentation, um, I deliberated uh, a lot about uh, this uh, uh, Polish-Ukrainian-Russian uh, dialogue. What topics could uh, be uh, could be um, considered during such a discourse. Uh, this is a question to you as a historian um, who has uh, been dealing with this part of the world and as a, as a German who has made this uh, tremendous work uh, with its historical memory. But in, in English, the first achievement of Germany was, was without any doubt to establish a friendship or good neighborhood relations with France. Uh, and it was really the uh, task of the uh, Adeno uh, German uh, Republic to establish contacts with the Gaulle in France. And uh, later, when uh, Merkel uh, came uh, to the uh, government, she said from the very start, she wants to achieve with Poland the same good relation uh, with uh, Germany has uh, with uh, France. And I think uh, these relations are working quite well. At least when I'm in Berlin, I see so many Poles there, uh, and not economic Poles who come there to work, but who are uh, represented in the scientific institutions and who uh, work there. And uh, as you remember, uh, France, uh, Germany, and Poland established a three party uh, connection or contact, uh, the Weimar Dreieck, uh, to meet uh, each other and to consult uh, each other. Now I think uh, that Poland is playing a very important role concerning the relations to Ukraine and Poland can only be helpful and I uh, very much hope that something will work out but on the other hand but this is a very personal opinion uh, your Minister of Foreign Affairs is a rather tough man and quite as I understand perhaps I'm mistaken quite anti-Russian. And, and I think we can go along only with discussions and, and not with brutality and not even with sanctions. But, but this is my, my, my uh, first uh, opinion. We have to see what we can do. I was very often in Ukraine in this last years, but most of all in the western part. And was, I was amazed about the intense connections between people from the University of Lviv or Lemberg or Lviv, uh, with Poland. And they all spoke Polish. Uh, and they went to Warsaw or to other Polish cities to study there. They got fellowships and Poles came to you know, Ukraine. So this worked already. At least I can always only speak uh, about the sphere where I'm active, uh, but I uh, think there were also other uh, contacts with, between engineers and, 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 and medical uh, doctors and, and so on. This should be pushed along, this should go further, much further, and this questions together, of course, how this is possible today, I have no answer. It's a very important subject matter today. I need you to thank you very much uh, that you 
talk to us again about the past. My idea, I'll tell you my idea and I want your comments. There is a book published by Peter Esterhazy, a Hungarian writer, who had a novel, uh, Sky a Harmony, about his father, how oh, was a nice man he was and how he was humiliated during the communist regime and this book was published and then it turned out that his father uh, worked for special services of the communist regime in Hungary since 1957 and he was responsible for people who were sent to jail and some of them lost uh, their life and then he made a second I uh, corrected uh, his uh, book and he added um, his uh, ideas rather while he was reading all this and he describes all his tears uh, when he found out about his uh, father about the events uh, that happened to him and he learned the second part of the truth and how he tried to save himself from his father to reunite with him later. This was a very interesting subject matter, and this relates to the past in Hungary. I apologize for... Uh, well, this book was published in Norway Literature Magazine. This is a Hungarian subject. And in Russia, we also have to deal with the past. Radzinski has a book named Stalin, and uh, tears were shed not by the son, but by someone who was liberated from the camp, who walks with his case uh, along the square and sees uh, children's feet, and he said, I started crying. And forgiving. And then uh, we know that nothing changed in the Soviet society. Uh, he saved, although he was the victim, he forgave, he forgave, although he was the victim. In Hungarian case, it was difficult. Uh, can you comment upon, upon this in any way? But it was was very wet in Germany, but a long time ago, some 20 years ago. I, I couldn't read it to the end. It was so long, so heavy, uh, as everything was uh, is written by Estherati. But uh, the story he describes, uh, I, I, I can tell you only from being close, more or less close to me, uh, can tell you at least 10 examples of, of this kind of many people found out uh, uh, that their fathers had uh, collaborated. Uh, this, the uh, Stasi in, in East Germany and kind of families broke down because they found out uh, that their wife was denunciating them or the other way around uh, and things uh, like that recently a very good friend of, of mine from the Central European University uh, in, in, in Budapest they discovered uh, that he also had a uh, tiny little bit for the security and, and it was an enormous scandal. I think we, 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 we should be careful to evaluate who did really a criminal act or who was just playing a secondary tertiary role uh, in the denunciation system. Do not forget uh, in uh, Eastern Germany they had hundred thousand kilometers of um, Stasi for a country of 17 million uh, inhabitants, which was 10 times more than in Nazi Germany. With this, I don't want to belittle Nazi Germany, but in countries where you have so many informants and everybody is approached to do this and, and, and this, I think we cannot come to peace and live in peace uh, if you think of everybody he was a spy and perhaps he did this and this. It was widely done uh, uh, after the end of reunification that the persons who were really implicated uh, in big demonstrations and crimes and, and so on that they lost uh, their jobs. 
uh, and this happened in other, other countries also, I think it happened in Poland, and uh, it happened also in, in, in Hungary in, in the beginning, of, uh, at least. Uh, Russia is another story. It was also much easier for Germany after the reunification. They just replaced uh, East German functionaries by West German functionaries. Uh, they spoke the same language, they had the same culture, this was very easy. With whom could you or would you help replace uh, your cadre uh, in, in, uh, uh, after uh, 1991? You had to work with the same uh, people. And in other uh, East European countries, to, to a certain degree. So I always think in building up new political cultures, new civil societies, we have also to have a certain pardon, a certain pardon, a certain good recognition that things are like this and they are not, not, not perfect. It depends, of course, on the involvement of the person in to criminal activities. But you cannot just denounce everybody in one. The book, Amibes uh, Nergarmonia, uh, Oscar Harmony, you, you can read it, it's very good. Mina. And then, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, as to the memory of generations, historic uh, memory, I'd like to hear your opinion about the existence of the state institution, an institution of national memory in Poland. I think that's the way it's called. Uh, it uh, deals with publishing, uh, research, uh, working in archives, giving out materials, do you think uh, this institution is necessary or the state policy should not be a historic policy? For your friends here uh, in this school, I would think it's very necessary and uh, it is doing a very good job. I know some people who work there. As I also think that it was very good that this kind of institutions uh, working in uh, East uh, Germany and that entire research institutions uh, are doing research how the systems function and how all this uh, came uh, about. But one thing is doing research about the functioning of these systems and the other thing is demonstration. And there I would be uh, of course, I'm a historian, I'm a university person, and you could call me naive, all those who are implicated in political uh, work. But I think I would make uh, this uh, difference. By the way, uh, if I may add, I'm very impressed about what is being published here in, in, in Russia uh, since the uh, 90s. One wants to know about the functioning of the Soviet system, one can know everything. Uh, the uh, publication of archival material is more important here than in East Germany. It was an immense work of what young or younger historians did in your country. The problem, the drama is it did not go into the public, and it did not even go into school books. Uh, but you have lots of information, to, you can be uh, informed. What you need are the polls and the checks and the government. A special institute for this, um, I'm not so sure. As I said before, I think also every country has to find its own way uh, to come up uh, with the past and also its own way to develop politics of memory or politics of 
history. By the way, politics of history in the German use of the word does not mean at all politics coming from above. It means much more that the civil society and the different groups of the civil uh, society are contributing to this. And the same is true for France. I would complain to you on a, a German who frightens me. Uh, that's a remark. He described Germany and simple people in Germany in the period between the wars. And now it's horrible to read a remark again. He's not a political analyst. He didn't make any analysis. He simply described people and what he described. Unfortunately, I see in my environment. Am I wrong uh, in being afraid? Do you not similar moments uh, between Germany of that time and Russia of the present time. It's a very long time ago that I read remark, and I must say, I tell you, I read them in the context which I described before, when Karl uh, Mannheim had developed his generational theory about the war uh, generation. And um, uh, remark is not present to me, but I could answer your, your question. But I do not think, not only I, I do not think, but I'm convinced that there will be no, no war between uh, Germany and Russia because of Ukraine and because of Nazi. I, I think. And by the way, I'm also convinced that neither the uh, British or the French uh, government are going in, into this direction. But uh, Germany are uh, upset what is happening in Ukraine. We heard this from Madame El Temple. But Germans are so profoundly still impressed by, by, by the war. And by our guilt and our responsibility, nobody will go there for a war. And, and by the way, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Maria uh, uh, Marx's uh, book was re edited now because uh, in, in Germany, as in France, and as in Russia too, there are many, many celebrations or memories of the First World War. So he is right again. But I do not know who reads him and, and his, which interpretation they, they read him. Well, the question is from your view. It seems to me that you are more concerned about your own surroundings than the remark. It seems to me that you are more afraid by your environment and not by remark. Probably we shall ask someone else. Uh, Uh, Konstantin Krylov from St. Petersburg. Question to a historian. Uh, criminal uh, prohibition for denunciation of Holocaust. Uh, is it good for fighting neo-Nazism? Because when you interact, when you make criminal punishments, uh, the academic uh, community Uh, cannot fight those who negate Holocaust. And now we have a certain forbidden fruit, uh, and you can easily catch uh, this with people who are not in the know. Criminal prohibition uh, of against Holocaust doesn't help to fight neo Nazism, or it makes it more complicated. It was practically not possible for Germany to reconstruct its post-war identity without taking the heaviest distances 
from Holocaust. And it was absolutely obligatory uh, to uh, introduce laws against people who denied the Holocaust. By the way, uh, France did this too, uh, and other countries too. Germany was not alone. But since everything started from Germany, and Germans are the main responsible for, for all this, uh, one could not have done this without. That there were neo-Nazi groups, this was unavoidable. Uh, and uh, to my great regret and, uh, and sadness, there is even one German member uh, in the new European Parliament who comes from a neo-Nazi uh, group. This has to do with this uh, stupid uh, German uh, laws uh, that uh, every group uh, in uh, Germany uh, could elect people and, and send them uh, to a process. Uh, up to uh, three uh, per percent. Uh, the problem, but there I'm not competent enough, uh, Madame uh, Temple could do this, say this better, is several years ago the government tried to forbid the neo Nazi party. Uh, and uh, our highest uh, legal board said it was not possible. Uh, because of infiltration into neo-Nazi neo parties by spies from, from, from the government and, and, and so on. Now there is a new initiative uh, to uh, forbid them. The uh, problem is what uh, many specialists are saying, you forbid them and they reconstitute themselves tomorrow under a new name. I think you, you can fight these groups only with democratic institutions, uh, with Prosvishenia, uh, with uh, initiatives uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the uh, society. And you have to start in schools. There's another problem in Germany, but also in uh, France, that young people are now going as uh, soldiers to Syria. And uh, these are not people of uh, Islamic origins. These are Germans or, 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 or French. And uh, this is for all our societies a terrible problem. How can we, with educational means, combat this fact? But this is another story. Uh, one more question from Poland. Alexander from Poland, that I come back uh, again to some nuances of Polish uh, German relations, historic relations. And I would like to come back to your words about uh, responsible but not guilty. Uh, and also, um, how do you as assess how? Uh, uh, society in Germany assess the activity of union of deported, I know how to say it in English, well, by Erika Steinbach. And how do you think, do, uh, what's the opinion in society, do this union should be directed more into acknowledgement of horrors and tra tragedy of deported people, or rather be seen in the broader context? And uh, another question. Uh, for example, in this case, would uh, governments, uh, post-war governments of Czech Republic and Poland also should be somehow regarded as responsible of what happened? Thank you. Uh, I said most of all that the youth is not responsible uh, uh, and not, uh, uh, I'm sorry, is not guilty, uh, but is responsible. Of course, the generation of my fathers was guilty. Uh, and it was right that we had these processes, not only in Nuremberg, but in, in Frankfurt, the uh, 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 Auschwitz uh, processes, uh, and, and so on. What concerns the uh, initiative group of uh, Madame Steinbach, I was more than opposed to it. Uh, Perhaps not everybody knows what it is, but uh, these are uh, former uh, Germans who lived in former times or before the war in 
eastern parts of Germany, which became uh, Polish, uh, and they founded after the war memorial groups. Uh, some were quite naive, and, and, and they just uh, cooked uh, what they had cooked before in these regions, and they dressed li like it. Uh, but some, and quite important ones in, in the Adenau, uh, Germany, wanted to get these territories back and were extremely against uh, Adenau's, um, uh, sorry, the Iran's uh, Ost uh, politics. Uh, Steinbach just left, uh, you have heard this, um, uh, this uh, union, and, and uh, this union doesn't play anymore such an important role. And I think that one can really say that it is totally ignored in uh, Germany, the eastern frontiers uh, with Poland. I read nowhere, in no serious Journal, uh, I hear in no uh, serious political discussions that th these frontiers are put into question. There was a little difficult time after, immediately after the reunification. People from uh, Eastern Germany did not agree with this. But these were, for the biggest part, extremists. And I I think this is over the recognition. Czechoslovakia surveys is more complicated. And there you have also organizations, most of all, of course, in Bavaria, but because there are the, the frontiers, who still have a very strong nostalgic attitude. And when I say nostalgic, it's a very nice sometimes they are much stronger oriented. But I think that the general German political attitudes and the, the main political parties do not go into this direction. Not only I think, I know, they do not go into this direction. The last question we are going to ask, who Marina. Marina Ilyushenko Khabarovsk. A specifying question. Yuta, tell me why conditions of building of democratic society in Germany was reconsidering by the post war generation of the heavy experience of Germany in the time of the Second World War. Why? I don't know how to respond. Uh, this is obvious. What will you do if you live in a destroyed country, if your uh, father never came back? I didn't know in my family uh, any man. Uh, they were killed. So why? Uh, so the question is why it happened. It was a natural question. What was there? I lived in the eastern part of Germany uh, till uh, 2014, and there was uh, propaganda that we made this war and due to uh, Russians uh, we suffered and now we are going to build a democratic republic and we were quite young uh, young children we believed into this and we were enthusiastic about it uh, we thought that Russians liberated us And uh, the most of that our parents didn't tell anything to us. Colleagues, I think you've had a wonderful chance to see that you, the sharer, is not a wonderful specialist, but he is a charming interlocutor and very interesting person. And uh, at the beginning, 
uh, we praised our efforts not in vain. Yuta uh, comes to us, she gets a Russian uh, visa, and this is wonderful. We hope that this is the way it's going to be. Let us thank our expert. Good appetite to you all.